Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church. My name is Jake Porter. It's good to be worshiping with you this morning, so I would uh, like to take this time to share some announcements. First, the uh, John Dykstra has told me to remind you that we're having a presidential estates service on August 29th. That will be that will be after our morning service, uh, and that we will be having the service at Presidential Estate. So if you would like to, be, to participate in that or come in any way, uh, there will be a meeting after church. We'll be meeting in the far corner of the fellowship hall. Uh, so right after church, meeting for the August 29 Presidential Estate service. Uh, there is also uh, a group of people from this church that are coordinating for the New City Kids uh, bike fundraiser. So if you want to know more about that, talk to Brian Van Zanten and he, you can either uh, contribute or you can sign up to ride uh, for that as well. And then the final announcement that I have is tonight we're having our second Levitical cookout at 530 where we're going to be joining together to participate in uh, a little bit about what the book of Leviticus is about. So I encourage you to come. We'll be meeting in my driveway at 530. Uh, if you would like to bring a side or a dessert, you are welcome to. Meat, beverages, and table service will be provided for you. Uh, it's a great spread. And if you are not capable of whipping up a side or a dessert, that's okay. There'll be more than enough food. And if there's not, God will provide. So, uh, 5.30 tonight, we're going to be talking about the food laws. I don't have any other announcements, so let's stand together as we begin worship this morning. Brothers and sisters, we are the body of Christ. We are the dwelling place of the Lord. So it's my joy to welcome you this morning into the presence of God with love, with joy, with grace, with peace, and with power. I encourage you to reflect on that as we worship the Lord together today, to uh, sense the presence of God. Uh, as we do every Sunday, let's pledge our allegiance to God once again by saying together the words of the Shema. So please repeat after me. Hear, O people of God. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul, with all, your soul. With all of your mind, with all, your mind. And with all of your strength, with all your strength. And, love your and love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. There is no greater than these. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together in song.
seated. Before we have our prayer time, Hukers, come on, you promised. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we're going to bless the kids together. And I have some special volunteers. I know. And that means a lot to me, Jay. Thank you. He said, I'm doing it just because I promised. And so it's good to be a man of integrity. So uh, stick your hands out towards a child near you or to the whole congregation. You, go, you all get to bless everybody. So let's bless the kids together by saying, may the Lord bless you as we worship and grow together. Thank you. I have just a few things to remind you of before we uh, have our congregational prayer. The first one is Carla Dykstra and James Dirksen were married yesterday, Friday, not yesterday, Friday. So congratulations to them. Uh, I would also encourage you all to pray for them as they uh, begin their new life together. So uh, continue to pray for them. And uh, Bunny Bergsma re continues to recover from uh, a broken shoulder and Charlie Postma is scheduled for a triple bypass surgery on August 2. So keep Charlie and Marianne and their family uh, in your prayers as uh, he is going in for surgery soon. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, you hear us when we pray. Lord, you hold galaxies in your hands, and you hear us when we pray. You've made the world so complex and so intricate that we still can't explain it. And you hear us when we pray. Lord, you care for us as individuals, as your people. You care for us and you desire for us to know that you are listening and that you act on our behalf. Because you, Lord, you hear us when we pray. So we lift up those from our community, from our local expression, our local body. We lift them up who uh, need to be remembered, who need a special dose of your presence, Lord God. We remember those who are hurting with injuries or fighting illness, particularly Bunny Bergsma, Bunny Bergsma and Charlie Postma, Michelle Butterworth, Jesse DeGroot, Lori Koinga, Gail Cricky, Sharon Andersma, and Pete Van Rice. Lord, we pray for them, and we remember them because you, Lord, remember them. And so we lift them up to you, and we ask that you would stir our hearts in how you would like us to show them that you love them and that we love them, because we know that you, Lord, hear us when we pray. We lift up those who are homebound, Adeline Limes and Hazel Coy, remembering those who have uh, reached the stage of life that they can no longer be mobile. And while they may be forgotten by the rest of the world, we, Lord, remember them because you remember them. And so we ask that your presence would be with them and that we would show the world how much they mean to us. And we ask that you would inspire us, Lord Jesus, because you hear us when we pray. 
Lord, we pray for your body, your people all over the world. We pray for the missionaries that we support, whether they be from Africa or in Guatemala or even here in West Michigan. Lord, we pray for those who are carrying your word, carrying your presence, carrying your name, Lord Jesus, into new and unfamiliar places. And we rejoice, Lord God, that you hear us when we pray. We pray for your people, our brothers and sisters, who are not part of this local community. We pray for the other churches in Hudsonville. We pray for your churches, your body, in our country, but also all over the world, Lord God. Both those in established congregations and communities where the church is uh, respected, where your word has influence. But we also pray for your body, Lord God, in the parts of the world where they are being persecuted. We pray for those who endanger their very lives or their livelihood simply because they bear the name of Christian. And so we ask, Lord God, that you would be with them, that you would give them wisdom and discernment as they live out their faith as they endure persecution, as they testify to the king who was crucified and yet risen again. And we lift them up to you, Lord God, because we know that you are with them already. And we know that you are faithful, for you hear us when we pray. Lord, we pray for those who don't know you. God, we pray for the countries that it's illegal to share the gospel. We pray for those countries that uh, are mostly secular. We pray for those countries where uh, they might even be majority Christian but there's still individuals who don't know you. We pray for them, Lord God, because you are the creator of all things. We pray for them because they also are made in your image, Heavenly Father. We pray for them because you too, Lord Jesus, are their king. We pray for them because you, Holy Spirit, are not confined by culture, are not confined by borders, are not confined by tongue, language, tribe. And we pray for them, Lord God, because you have said, you have promised that your kingdom, your body, your people would be made up of every culture in the world. And so we know that your faithful spirit, your word, will not return empty. And so we pray, God. We pray for those who are called to go all over the world to bring your good news to new people. We pray for those who are called to go uh, to places where you might have been forgotten and remind people of the love of Jesus. And we pray for ourselves, Heavenly Father, as we live and work and worship here in Hudsonville in West Michigan, we ask that we would be reminded of all those who don't know you. And we ask that we would have a heart to seek out those who are lost, to minister to those who are sick.
and to save all those who will be redeemed. And Lord, we ask all of this because we know that you hear me when I pray, just as you hear each and every one of us. And as we finish with the prayer that Jesus taught us, we ask that we would be uh, in tune, in touch with you, Lord God, knowing that prayer is a two-way communication. We ask that we would hear from you as much as we appeal to you. And all of this we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning is Leviticus chapter 22. We will be beginning at verse 31. Leviticus chapter 22, beginning at verse 31. It's on page 111 in the Pew Bible. Leviticus chapter 22. Throughout the book of Leviticus, God has been speaking through Moses to the people of Israel, and particularly to the tribe of Levi, and also to the priests. And today we're going to look exactly at what it means to be a priest. Uh, but in general, the priests were the one, the ones who would minister both to God and to the people. And so God gave clear instructions. Uh, we saw this, I forget how many weeks ago, but the second, second sermon that we had on Leviticus, when God gave instructions on how the priests were to conduct the sacrifices that had been explained in the first, uh, first group of chapters. And now we come back to uh, rules about the priests. So that way, the priests know what it means for them to live holy lives as priests. And so we get lots of instructions that we're going to look at just a little bit closer after we read our scripture. But this whole section about the priesthood and about the lives that, rule, that the priests must live by, it ends by this. So I invite you to look at verse 31 of Leviticus 22. The Lord said to Moses... And to all of Israel, he said to them, Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. Do not profane my holy name, for I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who made you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, May your word be our rule, may your spirit be our teacher, and may the glory of Christ be our single concern. Amen. Amen. So the question that we're going to answer today is, how do we live as priests for Jesus? And this is a question that I invite you to reflect on as we go through the sermon today. And then the one thing that I need you to write down uh, even if you forget everything else, remember this. A priest puts God on display for the world. A priest puts God on display for the world. So, going back to our passage, what in the world is going on with all of these rules for the priests? Why did they need to have rules, and what was so important about the priests being different, being set apart, 
uh, among the community of Israel? Well, these last verses tell us why it's important. So somehow, something about the, the living out of the commands that God had just given to the priests, something about that, following those commands, will reveal that God is the Lord, that God is that individual personal name of the I am that was revealed that is the only God of the Israelites. So somehow the things that the priests are doing are going to reveal God uh, particularly. And then also it will show that the Israelites look at God and see God as holy or set apart. And also it will reflect Israel's holiness and also something about the community, the kingdom, that God was establishing among Israel as he brought them out of Egypt and established them as God's own people. So let's uh, just real quickly go through chapters 21 and 22, just skimming through and see what these rules are about. God commanded the priests, a priest may not make oneself unclean for anyone not related to them. And so if a priest, there's a speaker there, a priest, so a son of Aaron, may not go to a funeral, so to speak, or enter the house of a dead body for anyone except his mother or father, his brother, or an unmarried sister. That's it. A close family relative, no one that a priest is married to. And then when you get on to the high priest, it even limits that even more. The high priest is not allowed to make himself unclean for anyone. And then it goes on and talks about the, the restrictions for those who can offer the food up to God. It says if anyone has uh, essentially anything that makes them not into what an ideal human would be. So if you were uh, a dwarf if you, or if you had been uh, mutilated or if you had uh, been uh, emasculated or all of, these, all of these different rules that it goes by, if you have a skin disease, if you have been in contact with a dead body, all of these things it lists and says, the priests may not offer the food up to God if they have these things. And so it's entirely setting them apart. And then it goes on and says, these are the people that priests can marry. And it lists the people that priests can marry. And then it goes on to say, when you're offering the food to God, you must do it in this way. Be super particular. Do it exactly the way that I told you. And in so doing, you will show to the world who I am, God says. So, what in the world is God trying to communicate? For the ancient Near Eastern people, they would have been familiar with the idea of, of priests. The Israelites would have known what a priest was even before God told them how their priests were to behave because every ancient Near Eastern culture had a priest and had multiple priests because only in, within the context of the ancient Near Eastern culture, only the Israelites, the Hebrews, were monotheistic. And so they all knew what priests were about. And the priests of a god would act in a particular way, would facilitate uh, service, worship, in a particular way, all with the idea of reflecting who God is. And for the god of the Hebrews, for our god, uh, the, the ideal, the goal for God is to be proven holy and to be true to God's nature. And the, the short, uh, shorthand that we've been going through has been the distinction between life and death. It gets more complicated by that, but life and death is a really good uh, way to sum it up. So everything that the priest was supposed to do was to separate life from death. And so why do priests have to not go to a funeral, which was how you would grieve both in the ancient world and also today? Well, because that's a dead body. That's death, literally death in the world. And so because the world is so tainted by death, God told a small group of people, he said, you all are going to live holy, set-apart lives so that when the world looks at you, they'll see me. 
and they'll see the life that I bring. So a priest puts the God on display for the world. And so it really is a two-way interaction. And so the priests will know about God and show God to the world, but then you all, when you want to worship God, you would come and the priest would help you offer your uh, sacrifices and your offerings to God. And so it's this two-way thing of the priest going into the holy for the people and coming out from the holy for the people. All right? And you all look at me and say, what? Let me give you an example. Ever since I was a small, small, small child, I have loved animals, particularly uh, ocean animals, particularly animals that live underwater. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but we don't get many fish crawling around um, on the land. And so it's really hard to see the fish in their own native habitat if you live on land. And so as a child, I was incredibly grateful for uh, nature shows that would go underwater and show me this whole world full of life that, I, that was strange and foreign to me. And it would allow me to see what it was like, just a little bit, to live under the ocean. But then, when I was 13... My parents gave me a scuba diving course as my birthday present slash Christmas because my birthday's in December. And so for, I don't know, 15 weeks or less, I don't know, I forget. It seemed like a very long time at the time, very long amount of classes at the time, but it flew by. I learned both in study and in practice, how one would come to a strange and foreign world that was full of life without being killed. And I kid you not, I was a 13-year-old in a class with almost all adults, and the, the teacher of the class, scuba certified instructor, nearly every week would be like, and you want to make sure that you do this properly or else you can die. You want to make sure that you check your equipment properly because, you know, the drowning thing. You want to make sure that you do your nitrogen equations properly because you can get the bins and die. I had not gone through driver's training yet, and so this was the first time that I was really, like, awakened to the fact that, wow, I'm entering into a place where I'm not really welcome. Where I don't really fit might be a better way to say it. And if I don't come into this presence properly, something really bad might happen to me. And so I paid attention and I followed the the directions and we did lots of swimming in a pool. And there's nothing more ironic than scuba divers when they're in a pool that's only like six feet deep. Because you could very much stand on your tiptoes and come out of the water, but we're all under there. And like, <sighs> but we did it all for a purpose. We went through the training, we went through the courses, we went through the practicing and the rituals to learn how to enter an entirely different world full of life safely. And effectively, we learned how to go into an entirely new world full of life safely. Brothers and sisters, that was the role of the priest. There was this divine presence that was literally living in their midst. And they knew that God was power and powerful. God set them free by the ten plagues. Divine judgment on the gods of Egypt. God had provided manna for the people of Israel in the wilderness. 
God had given instructions about how to come near to God, how to live as the people of God. And when the people rebelled and did things their own way, 3,000 of them died. And so the people of Israel knew that you could not just waltz into the presence of God. You had to do it the right way. And in the Old Testament, in the First Covenant, that way was through the priesthood. And so the priests were the ones who were set apart. The priests were the ones who were like the nature show, so to speak. So they were the ones who were able to go into the divine and then come out and share with you what the divine was like. But also, they would help you to come into the presence of the divine in a in your own way. And so you would experience the power and the presence of God. You would literally see the offering that you had brought from your own flocks, and God would eat it on the burnt altar through his nose, because God eats smoke. You would see the, the special part that was given to God that God would then uh, roast God didn't roast it, that God would then give back to his priests. And so the special part of your offering, the, I, the right breast, I believe, of a, of a sheep or a goat, you would take that and the priest would offer it to God and then cook it and eat it for himself. And so for the people of Leviticus, they could see with their eyes two things. First of all, that this God loved them enough that he wanted to eat with them. And that was a really big deal. And secondly, they could see with their eyes that if they followed things the way that the, 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 the priests would instruct them God had commanded, they could see that dwelling in the presence of God was possible. And brothers and sisters, I can't tell you what it's like to be in the presence of God. You have to experience it. Anyone who was at prayer meeting this morning could tell you what that's like. Because the Spirit was there in a powerful and special way that doesn't always happen. And it was amazing. But I can't explain it to you. You just have to experience it. And so the priests were the ones that would allow Israel to come into God's presence safely and appropriately. And so when you would bring your sacrifices, they would offer them up the appropriate way. When you, had, uh, when you needed to ask for forgiveness, when you uh, wanted to offer thanks, or when you were coming to pray for rain, all of those things, the priests were the ones who would mediate the presence of God because God was too full of life and full of power for any people who are tainted by death to just wander into the presence of God. And so after, uh, this is a picture of, the, the, of Herod's temple, which was around in, in Jesus' day. After the, the temple was established, the priest's job became much more formalized. Worship was becoming more firm, formalized for the, the Israelite people, but they still were doing the exact same job. They were taking the instructions of God and bringing them to the people, and they were taking the offerings and the prayers of the people and bringing them to God. And Herod built this temple with the express purpose of making it the most amazing building in all of the, the Eastern Roman Empire. And this is the largest temple complex in all of the Roman Empire, I believe, outside of Athens. And Athens was woo, ridiculous. It was the largest in the Eastern Empire. It was massive. And Herod was doing it because he wanted everyone to know that Herod had built it. But the Jews were okay with it. Because what is true about the God who delivered the Israelites out of Egypt? What is true about the God who set David apart and promised that his, uh, his heir would one day sit on the throne. What was true about the God who had uh, prophesied that the exile would come, but had also prophesied that the people would return? 
it was true that this God was great and majestic and beautiful. And so the Jews, even though Herod was doing it for selfish reasons, the Jews built this temple, not this temple, this is a model, but built the temple of Jesus' day to be amazingly beautiful. And the Levites and the priests were the the stonemasons and the architects on it because only priests can work in the presence of God, which is really cool and fascinating. And if you want to know more about the building of the temple, please let me know. The Wailing Wall on the left side, uh, that is actually the retaining wall. So Herod decided that the mountain wasn't big enough, so he was going to make the mountain bigger. And he built this massive retaining wall. And so those little weird colored marks at the bottom, those are people. So you can get some context about how big the stones are for the floor of the temple. This complex was massive. It was amazing. It was huge. It was beautiful. When you came to Jerusalem, you had to come up uh, over the Mount of Olives before you could see Jerusalem. And so imagine coming up the Mount of Olives, and then you come over, and then the sun is glistening off of this beautiful white temple that has gold uh, garnished with gold. You would just be overwhelmed by the amazing power and presence and, uh, and majesty of this God. And the priests were the ones who would teach the people about this God. And at the same time, offer... The gifts of God offer the gifts of the people to God. And so it's this back and forth. And remember, the role of the priest was to show who God was. Well, as the book of Hebrews goes into great detail to explain, so I'm not going to go into much detail here. If you want to know more, read Hebrews. Even though the priests, if, if the priests were doing everything God's way, which wasn't always the case, but even if they were, the rituals that God had given in the first covenant couldn't actually make people clean. They were a form of obedience until the Messiah could come. Until the one who could come that could actually make people clean. And so when Jesus came, we saw in a more clear way than any priest could ever do, no matter how holy they were, we saw who God was. Jesus is this perfect example of what it means for the divine to come near to us, but also for the cares of the people to be brought to the divine. And Jesus accomplished that for us that we could not do for ourselves. Namely, he made us clean and allowed the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And so now what? What has happened? What is going on now that we have the Holy Spirit? How should we look at ourselves? How should we view ourselves? Well, I invite you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 1 of chapter 2 in 1 Peter. It's on page 1,101. Oh my goodness, I didn't notice that before. The scripture passage we read was 111, and this is 1,101. So I, I don't know why that was so special to me, but it was. You all just didn't see it. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse, two, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. That's essentially a, a summary of what Jesus has done. He's chan- transformed us and changed us from being people of of uh, anger and and slander and avarice and all these other things into people who crave pure spiritual milk. And then as you come to him, Peter continues, verse 4, Jesus, the living stone, referencing Psalm 110, rejected by human beings but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, 
are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So pause for a second. What are we now that the Spirit lives among us? We are, in fact, the new house of God. The hundreds of thousands or millions of stones that it took to build the retaining wall, to build the, the courtyard, to build all of the, the features, the wall of the temple, the, the stalls, the place where the Sanhedrin would meet. Finally, the ha very house of God, all of it is made with stone. All of it is different kinds of stone, different sizes, different shapes. And all of it was expertly crafted to fit perfectly where it was meant to be. The stones, Chris and I had the opportunity to see the stones that were 30 feet below ground for the foundation of the retaining wall. 30 foot below ground. And they were just as perfect and just as smooth and fit together so well you cannot fit a credit card between them. Because the priests, the Levites, who were doing the work of building the temple, knew that this work was for God. And so they were going to do everything in their power to make the house of God precious and perfect. But now, because of Jesus, brothers and sisters, we are the living stones perfectly shaped and crafted by Jesus, our stonemason. That's what a tecton, a builder, was in the, in the first century Galilee. Crafted to be the beautiful house of God. So what are we supposed to do? Let's go on. For in script, uh, so we are the spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, meaning Jesus, will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall, still talking about Jesus. They stumble because they dis disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, Peter's talking about us again, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That's quoted directly from Exodus 19 when the people came to Sinai. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then Peter goes on, and I encourage you to go back and read the rest of 1 Peter to see what he says about what it means to be the precious people of God. So, what's going on? We are the priests now. But do we do the same thing? No, because our high priest has done for us what the priests of the first covenant could never do. The priests of the first covenant had to continually be offering ritual sacrifices to show by their obedience to God's law the, the promise that was to come, meaning Jesus. But we as a priest of the new covenant are not doing the same rituals over and over again. We have the amazing opportunity to be the dwelling place of the spirit, the temple, the house of God, the people who show who God is to the world. And when I say God, I mean particularly Jesus. We are the Jesus people. In the same way that the, 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 the priests would take the divine and bring it out to the people, we bring Jesus to the world. And I mean we corporately, the entire body of Christ. There is only one house of God, and it is the entire body of Christ built together. So how do we do this? How do we show the beauty and the majesty, the power, the forgiveness, the grace, the compassion, the love, the mercy that we ourselves have known in Jesus? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in one section, 
love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And he goes on to talk about how uh, if your enemy requires you to carry a burden one mile, carry it two. And I've talked about this before, but it's real quick, so we're going to go over it again. This is a picture of a, a Jewish per person dressed as they would in Jesus' day. And this uh, picture on the left is a picture of a Roman centurion. The Roman army, they were required to carry a pack when they were on the march uh, that weighed uh, between 40 and 80 pounds, depending on how much food they had in it and other stuff. And by Roman law, in conquered territories, the legionnaires could conscript a local to carry their pack for one mile because the Roman laws in all their wisdom uh, said that was the perfect amount to remind the people that they are a conquered people but not give them reason to revolt. All right? So any Roman soldier could come to you and require that you carry his pack for a mile. And you don't get to say no. If you say no, you're in rebellion and you might end up crucified. But Jesus doesn't say resist the evil person when he comes to require you to carry his pack one mile. He says, no, you show him how much you love him. And so when the Roman soldier comes, says some rude ethnic remark because they all thought that the Jews were backwards and stupid, and then throws his pack at you and says, carry that, you scum. You pick it up and you carry it. And then as you're coming near to the one mile marker, you say, friend, you look tired. I want to show that my God loves you. So can I, uh, will you allow me to carry your pack for another mile? Will you do me this great honor of allowing me to carry your burden for one more mile? Will you give me this divine moment of showing you what love looks like by being your slave for one more mile. Brothers and sisters, Peter continues in his gospel and he says, when you live lives like this, you're living lives that those who reject Jesus will testify to the goodness of God on the day of judgment. Do you know what that means? He, hear that and picture that in your mind. When we, the Jesus people, the priests of God, those who are holy and utterly set apart because we have experienced power and transformation because we are people of life through death, holy and utterly different. And we're sent into the world in such a way that we live out the teaching of Jesus. We show what it means to follow Jesus. We show what it means to be a disciple, one who walks in the dust of our crucified King. And Jesus invited us to do this by walking the second mile. And when we do that, not grumbling and complaining, not full of righteous indignation, not telling people how wrong they are, but full of actual sincere love. Actual love and compassion for those who are mistreating you. When we do that, we are being priests in the world. And obviously, I'm not talking about abuse. One should not be abused. This is a person in a position of strength who's choosing to lay their life down. 
If you want to talk about abuse, we can talk about it later. But Jesus is not for abuse. Just need to make that clear. Because Jesus is the king of life. And Peter says that when we live like Jesus, when we walk the second mile voluntarily, even those who are so reprobate, I think is our our good reformed word, so reprobate that they can't even see the gospel in that minute, when Jesus comes and says, you are condemned to hell for all eternity, they will say, you're right, Jesus, I should be condemned to hell because who here wants to be my volunteer? Nate? Because Nate walked the second mile for me. He loved me so much, sorry Nate if you're offended, he loved me so much that he carried my pack even as I spit on him. So you're right, Jesus, I deserve to go to hell because I couldn't see the good news of the cross in Nate. That's what Peter says will happen when we live out the life of our calling, of being holy people, of being a royal priesthood. But, and this is a huge but, but it's hard to be a priest It's hard to be set apart. It's hard to live a life of sacrificial love if you haven't experienced the presence of God. If you haven't felt the power that changes everything, that changes all of your priorities, that changes your your perspective on everything in life, if you haven't felt the presence of God in such an overwhelming way, I would say it's impossible to live the life that Jesus calls us to. And so if you're struggling, if you're struggling with how am I supposed to do this? How how could I ever do that for my enemies? Why would you call me to that, Jesus, if you're struggling with how this works? I invite you to seek the presence of God. I invite you to pursue intimacy with God. God is faithful and will meet you. Sometimes in your own personal Bible study, sometimes in prayer, sometimes in praise and worship, sometimes here as we sing on Sunday mornings, sometimes in in prayer meetings, sometimes as you hike, sometimes in the sacraments. We're all different and God is not bound by any rules except God's own. Is that What I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter how you need God to speak to you. He can speak to you that way. I'm not trying to get myself in trouble. (laughs) God longs, like a father longs, to be connected with his son. And I say son because I have sons. Yes, you're my son. As a father longs to be connected with his sons and desires for them to do the instructions that I give to them, not out of guilt or duty, but out of love and compassion. Our father desires for you to know his heart as well. Our Lord Jesus gave his life so that you could be his co-heir. The Holy Spirit, creator and sustainer of all things, was given as a gift so that we could feel the very presence of God and become new creations. And so, brothers and sisters, if you are struggling with seeing how this life of being a priest for Jesus works, trying to make sense of it, I encourage you, implore you, to go to our God. Come near to God through our high priest Jesus and seek his face. And his love will overwhelm all of your fears. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we are your people. And as much as we 
hope or wish or desire that you would just appear because we don't feel adequate to show Jesus to the world. That's not what you've chosen. And your ways are above our ways. And so you desire for us to be the priests of this new covenant. Your special possession, your royal priesthood. Living lives of self-sacrificial love so that the world will see who you are, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask that we would come near to you. That we would lay down our fear, lay down our uh, control, lay down ourselves so that we can find who we really are, who we were created to be as followers of Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together for a song of response.
Brothers and sisters, as you go, go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, now and forever. Amen. All right, why don't you grab someone's hand next to you? Come on, and come on, come on. Come on. My friends, may you grow in grace. <laughs> Grab hands. Grab Jim's hands.